We're all connected to each other, biologically, to the Earth, chemically, to the rest of the universe, atomically. I think nature's imagination is so much greater than man's. He's never gonna let us relax, relax. where things change all right but according to patterns rules or as we call them laws of nature i'm this guy standing on a planet really i'm just a speck i'm just a speck compared with a star the planet is just another speck to think about all of this to think about the vast emptiness of space billions and billions of stars billions and billions of specks the beauty of a living thing is not the atoms that go into it but the way those atoms are put together the cosmos is also within us we're made of star stuff and we are away from the cosmos to know itself across the sea of space, the stars are others. We've traveled this way before, and there is much to be learned. We're all connected to each other, biologically, to the Earth, chemically, to the rest of the universe, atomic. Find it elevating and exhilarating to discover that we live in a universe which permits the evolution of molecular machines as intricate and subtle as we. I know that the molecules in my body are traceable to phenomena in the cosmos. That makes me want to grab people in the street and say, have you heard this? The beauty of a living thing is not the atoms that go into it, but the way those atoms are put together. The cosmos is also within us. We're made of star stuff. We are away from the cosmos. There's this tremendous mass of waves all over in space, which is the light bouncing around the room, going from one thing to the other, and it's all really there, really, really there. But you gotta stop and think about it. About the complexity, you really get the pleasure. It's all really there, really, really there. The inconceivable nature of nature. To think about all of this, to think about the vast emptiness of space. There's billions and billions of stars, billions and billions of specks. The beauty of a living thing is not the atoms that go into it. Those atoms are put together. The cosmos is also within us. We're made of star stuff. We are away from the cosmos to know itself. Across the sea of space, the stars are others. We've traveled this way before, and there is much to be learned. That was the Talking Alternative Radio Encore Broadcast. We hope you enjoyed it. Now, for the live shows, professionals serving community, TalkingAlternative.com.
Good morning, good afternoon, and good night. I guess it depends when you're listening to me. I don't know where you're listening to me, but if you're live, I'm live. It's 10 a.m. Eastern time. It's Friday morning. This show is called Philanthropy in Focus. My name is Tommy D. I call myself, and now other people are doing it too. It's funny how you do things. You, you give yourself a name like the nonprofit sector connector, and then people start saying you're the nonprofit sector connector. So I am your boy, the nonprofit sector connector, Tommy D. And where am I? Well, if you listen to the show, or you pay attention to where I've been for the last year and a half. I'm just above the second floor, right below the roof. I'm in my attic. And that's where I am basically all the time. I'm in the attic. And every week I bring to you another leader of a nonprofit organization to help them tell their story, talk about their organization, and wait for it, amplify their mission. It's all about amplification here in the attic, especially Friday mornings it is. And look, here's what you've heard from me before. Nonprofits change our world every single day. And I was in my class last night with the Institute for Nonprofit Practice here in New York City. We were on Zoom, but with my cohorts there. And I, I was just saying like something I say all the time, if it wasn't for nonprofits, who does this work? Does it actually get done? Question, I don't have an answer for you. I, all right, I do. I don't think it gets done. I honestly don't because it's the nonprofit sector that does the heavy lifting and are often overlooked for the work they do, underfunded, and I'm going to get on my soapbox here on the underfunded thing, you know, a lot of foundations and, and corporate entities, excuse me, government entities, they don't want to pay for general operating expenses for organizations. That's not cool, man. It's just not cool. I'm going to get off the soapbox in a minute, but it's tragic the way I'll probably be up there. I'll leave it. I'll leave it right close so I can get back up there and complain about something else. But look, this is a shout out to, to anybody who wants to come on the show. If you run a foundation and you're in the giving side of things, I'd love to have you come on the show and let's chop it up and let's talk about how can we fix this? Because, you know, the people that are making the biggest impact in nonprofits, the employees, they need to be treated appropriately. Good salary, uh, a, a living wage, benefits, all right? We, we should talk about that. It's certainly, it's not our topic of discussion today, but it's ever present and it's certainly top of mind right now for me. So let's keep moving though. Each week I bring you, as I say, a leader of another organization. And uh, look, sometimes organizations are founded out of uh, challenge and, and strife and even tragedy. And, and we're going to talk about that today. What are my two favorite topics in the nonprofit sector? Well, you know, it's those who serve the intellectually and developmentally disabled, comma. It is also in equal, in an equal proportion. We need to do something about this stigma around mental health. We need to do something about this stigma around people not feeling right and needing support. Second episode of the show ever was Dr. Larry Grubler the CEO of Transitional Services for New York, TSINY, and they are working with many, many organizations to educate people and end this stigma around the conversation of mental health. I think there's a lot of celebrities that are coming out and talking about mental health issues. Um, I, I think it's important that we all realize this. Here it comes. This is statistics from a guy who doesn't have real statistics for you. My assessment is that most of us will go through some sort of mental health challenge in a lifetime. The statistics might say 20%, 25% of human beings. I don't know. I know a lot of people. And I think a lot of the people I know are having some challenges. My point is, it's, it's, it's sort of, um, it's a spectrum of challenge though, isn't it, right? Some people may have really serious depression issues that, that need to be addressed. And other people just, you know, I think we all get blue, but it's about support. Back to Dr. Grubler being on the show back in January of this year when we got going. He said, we all need some support, Tommy. We need support sometimes. So if we can find love and compassion and bring that to each other and support each other, whether it be in our own family, meaning in your home or our, or our larger family as a race of human beings, I think it's important that we talk about that. So let's say, without further ado, I do like hearing my own voice, but I have a guest here with me today and I'd like to hear from her as well. So, and this, I can do a show just if you want to listen to Tommy D talk for an hour. I mean, listen, I talk to me all day and it's not a bad conversation, but here's what we're going to do. I want to introduce my guest. First of all, even before I do the bio and stuff like that, I call myself the nonprofit sector connector. The way Marisa Giornella Porco and I got connected was from a friend of mine, Dr. Dorothy Martin Neville. Hey, Dr. Dorothy. Love you, Dr. D. 
appreciate you, appreciate you, your, your insight and your vision in making this connection so we can help amplify the message for the Jordan Porco Foundation. So Marisa, before I do your bio and stuff, good morning. How are you? Welcome to the show and welcome to my attic. Good morning and thank you. I'm very honored to be on, on your show and thank you, Dr. Dorothy as well. For She's making this Such, a cool, Such a cool lady, right? Yep. Yeah, so special. So we're going to get into this conversation. And, and look, you know, I can laugh and smile and, and, and whatnot. And we do talk about serious things here in the attic. And let me just I'm going to give you guys some frame of reference. Who is my guest? So I'm going to go through the bio. So I make sure I hit upon what I want to. Marisa Giornella Porco is the co-founder and CEO of the Jordan Porco Foundation, which we may refer to as JPF throughout the day today. So I can uh, save some breath. But it was founded in 2011 after the co-founders lost, lost their son, Jordan, to suicide when he was a freshman in college. Prior to starting JPF, Marisa had worked in human services since 1985, obtained her MSW, a master's in social work from the University of Connecticut. And her employment experiences range from the Connecticut Department of Children and Families to a number of different positions with mental health authorities in Eastern Connecticut. She's volunteered for decades in her community and is currently an active member of the Connecticut Suicide Advisory Board. And she regularly presents at conferences, workshops, and participates in panel discussions around this important topic of education around mental health and suicide in young people specifically. Marisa, let's just start. Start. You know, I usually ask folks and I say, all right, what drew you to nonprofit? Now, you know, we're going to talk about the story and, and how this organization came to be, but you've, for many, many years, you've been involved in, in the social work space. What sort of drew you to that work before we even get into the, the foundation? Yeah, that's a good question because that was a long time ago, right? Um, almost like 40 years ago, right? But I, you know, there was, we, we had some issues in our family growing up and a lot of things that weren't talked about and there was a lot of shame and um, stigma associated with mental health issues in our family. And I was drawn to it as an undergraduate, um, kind of like, you know, I studied sociology, I studied psychology. I loved doing research. I was really into like um, organizational um, psychology back then. Um, and I kind of ended up stumbling on my first job. Um, I had done some work with the National Association of Social Workers when I was an undergrad, I, I worked there. Uh, got attracted to social work, um, got a job at DCF at 22 years old, didn't know what the heck I was getting myself into, um, and stayed there for 12 years. And during that time, I ended up getting my master's in social work. It made the most sense for my personality and for the way I see the world in terms of all the systems that impact people. And it's like, a, you know, looking at the person that's struggling or the family that's struggling in a multi-systemic way. And that's really kind of my training. Um, and it just really, it just worked for me um, to really um, get that kind of training. Yeah, that, that, that's awesome. And, and what I'm curious about, where you said that the multi-systemic way and how the MSW for you made a lot of sense. Are, does that mean, I, I'm not going to assume what it means, because the word holistic is coming up for me right now where it's not like, oh, you have this issue, let's solve this problem, whether it be some level of therapy or some medication or whatever. There's a lot more factors. Isn't, isn't that what you're speaking to there? Yeah. And I think back then, I mean, things have changed dramatically in how we look at people's experiences and their trauma and understanding mental health and even just the advances in science. But back then, like looking at, look, this, your problem or whatever your struggle is right now, whatever your family struggle is, there's probably a lot of reasons for it. And it's not just, you're not doing this right, or you're not parenting right. It may have to do with poverty. It may have to do with discrimination and racism. It may have to do with systems that really keep people from being able to be their best self. And so, um, that training really just made you look at all the forces that make um, getting through things, getting through life difficult. And, you know, so it, so really it just, it just made sense for me. And um, it was also a degree, of course, I'm a MSW, you know, I like to push my degree, but I just, it's also uh, an MSW degree also has a lot of, you, you can work in a lot of different settings. So over the years, over the decades, I have seen people take leadership, not only in nonprofit, but in government and even in for-profit. 
and you know, getting a degree, uh, becoming an attorney with an MSW or going into public health with an MSW, it just gives that extra layer of um, attention to, again, systems that, um, and how we operate within those systems. Um, and so you have a global picture of how to help people. I love that you're bringing that up and, and you know, the, the audience of this show and, and, and like I joked at the beginning, you know, where, I don't know, it, it, this is live every Friday morning at 10 a.m. here on uh, Facebook and, and here on talkradio.nyc, but then it also goes on to the podcast platforms. So, platforms. There we go, Tommy. So, uh, you know, somebody might be finding this at a later date and you know, while we are here to talk about the foundation, just what you're talking about, there might be young people who want to help and want to give back and maybe are not even sure what direction their career might be going in. But with, to your point, having the MSW, the Masters in Social Work, really opens up a variety of different opportunities. It doesn't mean I, quote unquote, have to run a nonprofit organization or that I'm going to always be in social work. As you said, executive wise, you can be governmental, you know, certainly, um, you know, I, I'm sure there's some application inside of corporate for MSWs, whether it be for, on the HR side or training and development or, or just, you know, uh, HR. So vice president of people, director of people, director of, um, of the associates and employees and all that kind of stuff really, you know, has a social work bent to it. So it really sets the stage for people to have a lot of different opportunities. And there is a shortage of people doing clinical work in this country. And we know with the rising needs for mental health, which is what we're gonna talk about, we need people to go into these fields. We need clinicians. We need folks that are going to be trained um, to help other people on a professional level. So that's a shout out to young men and young women. And, and I take that back. That's a shout out to anybody because you know what? It, it, you might be 40, 50, 60 years old and, and have, have done a career and want to do a different career. We need people in this clinical space around mental health, which is going to be much of our topic for the next three segments of the program today. Marisa Giornello Porco of the Jordan Porco Foundation is my guest here. This is Philanthropy in Focus. I'm setting you guys up for a quick break. We'll be back in 90 seconds. Uh, look, we're here to amplify the message. Maybe when we come back, Marisa might sing the, the lyrics of the song once she learns them. Aha, uh -huh, just setting you up for that one. Uh, we'll, we'll be right back. 90 seconds, Tommy D and Marisa in the attic. Philanthropy in Focus, right back. Are you a business owner? Do you want to be a business owner? Do you work with business owners? Hi, I'm Stephen Fry, your small and medium-sized business or SMB guy. And I'm the host of the new show, Always Friday. While I love to have fun on my show, we take those Friday feelings of freedom and clarity to discuss popular topics on the minds of SMBs today. Please join me and my various special guests on Friday at 11 a.m. on talkradio.nyc. Are you a conscious co-creator? Are you on a quest to raise your vibration and your consciousness? I'm Sam Leibowitz, your Conscious Consultant. And on my show, The Conscious Consultant Hour, Awakening Humanity, we will touch upon all these topics and more. Listen live at our new time on Thursdays at 12 noon Eastern Time. That's The Conscious Consultant Hour, Awakening Humanity, Thursdays, 12 noon on talkradio.nyc. Are you on edge? Hey, we live in challenging, edgy times, so let's lean in. I'm Sandra Bargeman, the host of The Edge of Every Day, which airs each Monday at 7 p.m. Eastern Time on talkradio.nyc. Tune in live with me and my friends and colleagues as we share stories and perspectives about pushing boundaries and exploring our rough edges. That's The Edge of Every Day on Mondays at 7 p.m. Eastern Time on talkradio.nyc. You're listening to Talk Radio NYC. Uplift, educate, empower. Nonprofits need connections to move in good directions. So cut through all the static. Join Tommy in his attic. Many shows in history, or how many shows even right now, have a theme song with the word attic in the theme song? 
probably just one, right? I love it. I love it. <laughs> I'm gonna cry. I think it's I think it's the only one. I and I go around the house and my four kids sing that song to me, and one of my boys calls me Mr. Static because he knows the song Static in the Attic, the whole thing. So listen, back to the show. Philanthropy and Focus, focusing on amplifying the message for nonprofit organizations, having serious discussions specifically today around mental health issues and, uh, and the issue of suicide. So I'm going to read to you all uh, some background on the organization, on the foundation. JPF or the Jordan Porco Foundation engages is in engaging and uplifting programs that emphasize peer-to-peer -peer messaging, promoting help seeking behavior, self-care and coping skills. This is this organization is to pro promote those. I'll say it again, to promote help seeking behavior, self-care and coping skills. Their programs challenge the stigma by talking openly about mental health and educating about the risk factors and warning signs of suicide and other related mental health concerns. They do this through education, awareness and innovative programming. And they, they to accomplish this, they, they work inside of schools. They have engaging and uplifting programming. I saw something just, I was watching some videos this morning about um, fresh check day and the check-ins and some of the stuff I, I think we'll talk about today. So take us to, uh, to this organization, Marisa. You know, it, it, as, as I said up front, you know, it comes out of this tragedy of losing your son, Jordan. Um, it, it, tell us as much of that story as you want to and really how you find the the silver lining to say, you know what, we need to address this and we need to get out in front of this so other families and, and communities and schools, um, hopefully this we can get rid of this problem and this challenge in society. Sure. Um, so we started the foundation 10 years ago after we lost Jordan. He was a college freshman, um, second semester um, up in Vermont. And um, Jordan was the last kid you would think that would die by suicide. Um, as you mentioned earlier, I'm a social worker by profession, and we didn't have a lot of taboo subjects in our home. We talked about everything. And um, so, you know, when this, when we got the call, I'm like, you got the wrong kid. Um, and unfortunately, you know, I don't have to get into all the details, but a lot of things happen and happen really fast, you know. Um, and one of the things that I say when I speak publicly about this is my son knew better, right? He knew that he could reach out. He knew that there was a counseling center, but I think the heaviness and the stigma and the discrimination about help seeking, especially with guys who are supposed to have it figured out, right? And they're supposed to be tough. Um, you know, it, it just didn't happen. And so um, with this tragedy, we said, oh my God, you know, something's good has got to come out of this because you know, this, this had a ripple effect on an entire community, on a big Italian family, school systems, you know, up in Vermont. He had just been there for, um, you know, not even six months, you know, and had made some really solid friends and had been there with people that he knew. Um, and, you know, despite all this, this could happen to anybody. And um, so we developed our programs by looking at what type of event my son would have attended. My son would have never attended a suicide prevention event or mental health event that was being hosted on campus. Um, and so we developed a program with a lot of, lot of input from a lot of creative people and friends and family and all the support that we've got. Cause you can imagine we were, you know, brains weren't working back then in terms of the impact on my family and myself and, it's just the trauma of having to bury your child. Um, we came up with this idea, which is called Fresh Check Day. And it's checking in on college students, right? And it's interactive and it's peer centered. So the, the messages aren't coming from the adults in the community. The messages are coming from the student groups on campus and the activities. It's like a mental health fair, right? With a little, you know, messaging, a suicide prevention messaging. And you, it's, what we call in the business primary prevention, right? So you've got interactive booths and you've got food and giveaways and incentives for participation and therapy dogs and music, all the kinds of kid things that are gonna attract a college student to attend a mental health event. Without the, you know, again, without the thing like you're walking into an auditorium and you're listening to a mental health speaker and people are gonna be looking at you as to why you're there, right? And this is, again, we're talking about something 10 years ago where it really wasn't talked about as much as it is now. 
Well, can I, I just stop you one second yeah. there? I mean, yeah, it's a different world in the last 10 years. You yeah. know, so I, I mean, you, you, I don't know if this is the right way to say it, but you might get more buy-in now, but still the auditorium with talking heads is not ever really going to be attractive to, you know, maybe a small subset, maybe those folks who are on track to get their MSW might be attract, you know, an 18 year old who, who has that vision might be in that auditorium, but, you know, we were still 10 years ago, not that we figured this thing out, but there is more awareness now in 2021 than there was just, you know, just 10 years ago. Um, so what was it like trying to create something and, and how do you even do this? Like you have to get buy-in from, you have to get buy-in from the university, then the clubs, then you got to organize. And then you got to have all these, talk to us about that process because a lot of people who plug into my show run organizations are, are, are run programs inside of organizations and they have to do events. And, and, then, and any insight where you were taking something from, didn't exist to now it's a thing it, it is going to give, you know, success leaves clues, as they say. So there should be some, some nuggets for people as you did oh, that. Well, so we started developing this plan and I ended up at Eastern Connecticut State University, which was at that point, I was living in Andover, Connecticut. It was like 15 minutes away. We decided to stumble into this counseling center and introduce ourselves. It was a suicide prevention event at Eastern introduced ourselves to the director of counseling and talked to her for hours about this concept. And she was willing to not only help us develop the program, but also host it on campus. And so we piloted our first event at Eastern Connecticut State University in 2012, a year and a month after my son died and had over 500 kids there. Um, Eastern's known as a suitcase college, you know, kids go home. Um, and next thing you know, by 2013, we went from one to five because other schools were hearing about it to 11. And then by 2015, we have to scale this program nationally because colleges outside of Connecticut were asking for it. And, and it really like, look, we tried this. It was a leap of faith. We're like, oh my God, is this really going to work? And it did because it was the peer-to-peer -peer messaging. It was reducing the stigma and discrimination about getting help, knowing who the people on campus are who can help us. So it's so when you think about a student on campus, like they are in a new community. They don't necessarily know where to get help, right? If they're struggling. They're also feeling, they need connection. Our young people need to feel connected. So they may not know where to go or who to talk to, so you might have um, the counseling center there. You might have the LGBTQ community, a group there, like the, the student group there, the women's club on campus that might be talking about um, body image, right? Or disordered eating. So you have all the different components that really might lead to somebody being at risk of suicidal ideation, self-harming uh, or suicide. So you never know who's gonna come to your fresh check days. Like that's the design of it. But you never know if you're, if you just need enough information to know that to help your roommate or to help your, your your friend on campus or to help help your classmate, right? So it's this universal messaging that's made that's put together in a very fun way, and I think despite the fact that it takes a little bit, there's you know we work with colleges and we don't physically go and host these. We have a turnkey operation now because we're all over the country. We're in 42 states. We've hosted over 800. Since 2012, 800 uh, fresh check days across the country. What are you, um, I'm sorry. Let's go with statistics. We weren't going to talk statistics, but these are yeah. ones you, you know. So 42 states, right? Uh, 270 many, colleges and universities. That have at least done this once. And I guess once they do it, it becomes a part of their curriculum or, or event calendar, right? So 80% of our colleges come back every year. Come back. Okay, so 42 states, 270 colleges, and 800 of these events have happened. I mean, look, folks, 800 interactions of young people who either might be having these, these ideations or challenges themselves, or like you just said, there, Marisa, is you said you never know who will attend. They, they're going back to a dorm after this. They're going to you know, a party that Saturday night, they're going somewhere and this is making them more aware. Let's say they're all set personally. 
but it makes them more aware to look out for their peers. It makes them more aware and understanding. And, I, and I'll use the word, although it hasn't come up yet, I don't think, or, or maybe we said it when you, you and I were talking earlier, where's the compassion about it, right? I think there's an incredible amount of compassion that can come out of this because, you, you know, empathy might be a better word. And it's, the, it's that situation where uh, you, you need to help, you need, you need some support, let, let, maybe I can help you versus like, you know, just not knowing, not even being aware. So, but, but to the statistics, you know, of, of the amount of impact, 800 events, thousands of lives have been changed by the work you've done. That's just, that's, that's the truth. So in, you know, in honor, in, in memory of Jordan, you're making this incredible impact. And I tell you that to just say thank you for that. And I'm grateful for what you're doing. And families across this country and, and communities should be grateful. And I'm sure they are. Um, what, when, when the day, ha like you say, it's a turnkey situation. So if a college or university wants to plug in, how do they go about doing that? Like, you know, with 270 colleges, that's, that's just, you know, that, that's, those are great numbers, but there's many, many more colleges and universities that could use this type of service. Yeah. So when you say turnkey, or maybe we, what, what I want to ask is, let's say, let's ask this question before the break. How do, how does a college or university get to plug into this program? How do they get to take advantage? They go to freshcheckday.com and they, they apply, they contact us, and we start the process. We'd like to have at least three months of planning with them. Um, we provide them with the handbooks, the ideas for the interactive booths, the manuals, how to do the social media on campus, how to market it, who to work with. I mean, it's totally laid out. Um, all they have to do is contact us, um, and we can get them on their way and get them on a schedule. Awesome. So to do that, they, the website again is freshcheckday.com or .org? Okay. Dot com? Dot com, yeah. Freshcheckday.com. Um, Jordan Porco Foundation, Marisa is here with me this morning, and uh, this is Philanthropy and Focus. We're going to take a quick break. Right when we come back, let's talk more about... Um, you know, the, the experiences of, of these young people and the, 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 what you, the feedback you've received and, you know, how some of the, you know, I'm sure there's dozens and dozens of, of I don't know if success story is the right word, but impact story. Let's go with that and how that's changed. So we're going to be talking about the Jordan Porco Foundation in more depth when we come back. This is Philanthropy and Focus. I'm Tommy D. We'll be right back. Howdy. I am Joseph Franklin McElroy, host of the new podcast, Gateway to the Smokies. It airs on talkradio.nyc every Tuesday night from 6 p.m. to 7. Every episode is dedicated to memorable experiences in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park and surrounding areas. This show features experts and locals who expound upon the richness of culture, history, and adventure that awaits you in the Smokies. Tune in every Tuesday from 6 p.m. to 7 on talkradio.nyc. Are you passionate about the conversation around racism? Hi, I'm Reverend Dr. TLC, host of the Dismantle Racism Show, which airs every Thursday at 11 a.m. Eastern on talkradio.nyc. Join me and my amazing guests as we discuss ways to uncover, dismantle, and eradicate racism. That's Thursdays at 11 o'clock a.m. on talkradio.nyc. Are you a small business trying to navigate the COVID-19 related employment laws? Hello, I'm Eric Sauber, employment law business law attorney and host of the new radio show, Employment Law Today. On my show, we'll have guests to discuss the common employment law challenges business owners are facing during these trying times. Tune in on Tuesday evenings from 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. Eastern time on talkradio.nyc. You're listening to Talk Radio NYC at www.talkradio.nyc. Now broadcasting 24 hours a day. Nonprofits need connections to move in good directions. So cut through all the static. Join Tommy in his attic. Yes, that's what I'd like you to do. Cut through the static. Get that static out of the way, man, and meet me in the attic, please, every Friday morning, 10 a.m. Your boy. My wife asks me, I said it last week on the show, when are you going to stop being your boy, Tommy D? Never. 
when all my hair falls out and I'm an old man with an old gray beard, I'll still be your boy. Your old boy with a cane or a shillelagh maybe, but still your boy, Tommy. <laughs> all right. This is philanthropy in focus. I like the sound of my own voice, but let's listen to Maurice's voice again, because that's better than what I have to say. So I want to know, you know, we're talking to Marisa Giornella Porco, co-founder of the Jordan Porco Foundation, working hard to educate individuals, young people uh, and families and communities and colleges and high schools. Uh, how do we have the conversation around mental health issues and how do we have the conversation and break the stigma around the suicide conversation? So Marisa, what, what is, give me some of the, the feedback after having been involved with 800 of these events across 42 states, 270 different colleges. What kind of feedback do you get from these communities and, and um, impact that's been made from, from doing these events? Well, we have a post-event survey and our numbers are consistent in terms of these kids are getting the message. They're understanding the goals of our Fresh Check Day. And our facilitators on college campuses, the ones working with the kids and organizing the Fresh Check Day, again, 80% of our colleges come back because they, they know that this is one way to message the kids. I mean, it's not a one and done. It should always be part of more of a comprehensive, comprehensive suicide prevention plan on a college campus and mental health promotion. I mean, when you think about the statistic that 10, the, but the second leading cause of death for people between the ages of 10 and 34 is suicide. This is a serious public health issue. Say that, that, again, we, for me. Say, say that again for me, it's just so we get that stat. It's a serious public health issue. What, it's the second leading cause of death for people between the ages of 10 and 34. That's a problem. This is a problem. This, this is this, a problem. This is, a, this is an issue. This is a big issue. This is severe. It's not, you know, this is not a small segment of the population. So, you know, in terms of, you know, I can quote, you know, we've, we've got our feedback, we've got our surveys, but we've got just, we have several stories and we get a lot of written feedback from the students. But some of the, the two stories that I'd love to share with this group right now, kind of really quickly, um, several years ago, um, one of the college campuses that we have, very big university here in Connecticut, um, they always host it on spring weekend. And it's right before finals, the kids are totally stressed out with finals. And one student actually ripped up, was planning on um, dying by suicide after graduation and ripped up her suicide note and told her therapist. And so, you know what, you don't always get stories that show you the impact, but we know this has a message, right, for students. The other story that I'd love to share with this group, and this was, we were doing a presentation on one of our other programs to a group of educators in Connecticut. And this one young woman comes up to the, us after and says, you know, I attended your program at a local university and I always thought there was something wrong with me, but I didn't, didn't know what was going on with me. And then I realized after coming to your program that I was suffering from anxiety. So I went and I got help. And I mean, it just, to me, that's what matters, right? That you're not alone with your struggle struggles. Not everybody else has it figured out, which is what a lot of college kids think, right? Yeah. And that we're all struggling with something, even if our social media persona yeah. indicates all else other, you know. Yeah. I think I think I've learned at this point after 43 years of being on this planet that nobody has anything figured out. And that's and when like I used to think everybody had it together, man. Like everybody's like, you know, because I have some of my own stuff going on in my head because like I say, a lot of us do. Uh, I think most of us do. And, but as I get older, I realize nobody really has it figured out, man. Like we're just trying to get by. And and when you when you can realize that. And I'm not coming out of a textbook, gang. This is what I feel. This is just me. Um, I, I think when you realize that, you go, oh, we're kind of all in this together, which is the whole point of this thing, this life is, you know, why am I doing this show? Why am I doing 60 Days of Nonprofit Service? You know, not so people could say how great Tommy D is. That's not a thing, man. I'm doing it to show that we're supposed to be connected. We're supposed to be helping each other out. And if that's, if that's the if that's what this life is, is connection and relationships and support and helping each other, 
and not this crap of to your point marisa of like you know the instagram like persona of and i know this is affecting our young women and girls i i, I don't know proportions and, and rates compared to men or, or boys but I saw something on one of the videos on your website this morning and it was about, it was one of the, the fresh check days it, like early on. And one of the poster boards was a big poster board of all these misconceptions or um, challenges that young girls are up against. And they had like this bucket of water and some chalk and you like dipped your fingers in the water and the chalk. And then you crossed out this with it, whether it be body shaming or whatever the, the thing that was kind of, um, challenging one of these young ladies and they would go up on the board and kind of cross it out. And just that and there was another one where I saw like whatever their anxiety was, they, they'd write it on a piece of paper and then a big trash bucket. And then that was like just those gestures of doing that. But I, I mean, maybe, you know, not that this is your specialty, but the social media thing, man, like I, 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 I worry about Forget I worry about the addiction to social media, which is a whole nother thing and a whole long discussion and that challenge and the, the, the dopamine rush. Every time my phone lights up, you know, we get excited like, ooh, a text message, an email, right? All that or a, or a, or a like. Um, I, what you just said about, you know, young people and that this, this persona and you and I kind of set it together, like that's not real like all that stuff, like nobody's always on. And that, and as a 13 year old girl or boy for that matter, and you see that stuff, you think that I, you know, an individual would think, oh, I'm less than because that person either has more stuff, it, you know, it, whatever this word prettier means, you know, like, you know, how are these kids, so you can't get away from it, unfortunately. And now I'm, I apparently I hear my own voice again, I'm going after it again, but it's like, I'm cranky and, and frustrated about this stuff because I do have two daughters and I have two sons and I'm just trying to figure out how to, how to do this thing called parenting. Um, 12 years into it, I'm still trying to figure it out. But my expectation is you'll probably tell me I'm always going to be trying to figure it out. It doesn't, it's not anything that like nobody, you know, uh, my father-in-law always says, you know, you weren't, uh, you didn't arrive with like a handbook to explain how to do this. And I, I, you know, it's one of the things he says that I, I certainly agree with. Um, social media in your experience with some of these kids if you have some feedback on that and then also how did you have to pivot the big word of last year and still this year how did you have to take some of these events when you couldn't when nobody was on campus i'm sure you know as you and i would agree the challenges in young people and all of us for that matter got even more severe during uh the lockdown and, and being you know staying at home and whatnot what do you know about the social media? If you want to talk a little bit about that and then, and then how did you do this during last year and, and maybe into this year that word virtual again? Yeah. So quickly, I mean, so there's a lot of statistics out there, even before this big f Facebook, you know, yes. announcement, you know, that uh, the whistleblower event is that the, the, there was a significant increase in suicide deaths with the onset of the smartphone. <sighs> So, you know, that's, that's enough, you know, the 24 hour news cycle, we wonder why, you know, our kids are experiencing so much anxiety, nobody can shut it off. Right. And again, that whole concept of effortless perfectionism that we can put these personas on social media, it certainly makes doesn't make people feel connected. And, and, and I know there's been some research out there that suggests that our young people are as lonely as what we would think of the elderly being lonely that this friends, all these friends that people have, they're, they're not real authentic relationships all the time. And so there's a loneliness component to all this. And then exacerbated by the pandemic and the isolation and just the up upheaval of all that. Um, and then to answer your question, what we did last year was we pivoted and we made our, our programs virtual and we still had a hundred fresh check days last year. Yeah. 50 in person, 50 virtual, depending on where you were in the country, you know, depending on what was going on with COVID. So, um, you know, it was, um, it was a, we, 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 we moved all our programs to the virtual space and it still worked. And, um, and it was, I, I was glad we were able to do that. Yeah. I, I thank you for sharing that. And uh, it, this social media is a beast, man. 
And it's one of these things where, you know, what, what do we do here? Because the toothpaste out of the tube, and it's one thing if it was just put there as a neutral party, but to your point about the whistleblower and everything, it is not a neutral party. That is completely manipulative. There's a lot, I think it threw extra letters in there. It's really manipulating us is what I was trying to say. And I, I, I don't know how you stop it. There was that one, I don't know if you saw that Netflix special, um, The Social Dilemma. Yeah. Oh, I know. Oh, my oh. God. And that was yeah, like, yeah. again, look, maybe we, maybe I'll say for myself, maybe I was naive. Like I thought like these companies weren't just doing what they, if you haven't seen the movie, spoiler alert, they basically are selling all our data. So we're freely, why is it free to go on Facebook? Well, cause I'm giving them all types of stuff that they take all this time you information and then they sell it to advertisers and people who want to sell me stuff. Um, let, I want to talk before we go to a, a quick break. I, what, what's the, the for next the for the what's next program is it something that's coming up right that that we wanted to talk about well when back in 2015 we were getting uh, a lot of people were asking us to start younger you know and start addressing this issue younger and so we started um developing our for what's next program which is a psychological resiliency program for middle and high school students regardless of their setting so it doesn't have to be a curriculum that is hosted in schools and it's really five modules, um, three to five modules um, that talks about mental health. You know, we all have mental health, right? And um, coping skills. When is it time to, our framework is, when is it time to reach in for your coping skills? And when is it time to reach out, right? Neither one of those decisions is always the right answer. Um, and just really being able to practice those skills with conflict management. Um, and then we also have a time and money module because that was really a lot of the focus groups and a lot of the curriculum writing that was what a lot of the schools were saying we need to talk about time and money because that stresses kids out so we talk about mental health with kids and we open up the dialogue and we made this um, program something that anybody working with kids can actually use so you don't have to be a social worker you don't have to be a psychologist you could be a coach you could be uh, um, somebody running a youth group in a church to open up the mental health conversations and reminding our students and our young people who their trusted adults are. Where do they go now? And, and if they're transitioning to high school or they're transitioning to the workforce or college, what, where is their new support group gonna be? What does that look like? And so we, we have this curriculum developed to really open up those conversations. So that's curriculum that, you know, if I wanted to get that implemented in my school system here in Nassau County, that it, I could, they drive that through health departments or, or like who ends up delivering it, or I guess it varies based on. It on varies. The, yeah. So it could be a middle, like it could be an after school program. It could be a summer camp program. It could be a youth service bureau. Um, we've seen it in all different kinds of settings. It could be the Girl Scouts. Like okay. anybody working with kids can actually deliver this program so I, I shout out to my buddy paul rubin he's been on the show um camp good morning m-o-u-r-n-i-n-g bereavement camp uh taking place out here on long island this weekend uh first time they've done it in a number of years in person based on you know what we're dealing with in history here um but paul this might be something i think you and marisa should connect i'm doing i'm supposed to be doing a show and i'm doing networking it's Tom, <laughs> one thing at a time brother um, but <laughs> I want you to connect and I think there's something there for that. And I'd love to talk more about bringing this into schools here on Long Island. Uh, what we do when we come back, I'm going to share the website when we take a break right now. But what we do when we come back is, Marisa, I want you to talk to me about the future of this organization and what you need. What are the connections? Tommy, there's this bugaboo that's keeping us back from doing this. And I can say, well, maybe I know somebody or maybe my listeners know somebody. Shout out to Mick Collins checking in on Facebook. Always love you listening and watching my show. This is Philanthropy and Focus. Maurice and I will be right back to talk about the future of the Jordan Porco Foundation and how you can help. Right back. Join us every Tuesday at 4 p.m. Eastern for the Mind Behind Leadership, where we focus on what leadership really means to us and to others. We have practical discussions with the CEOs of some of the world's largest companies, owners of small businesses, and experts in psychology and behavior to get that inside track, what to do, what to avoid, and what really happens. Join me, Graham Dobbin, at the new time, 4 p.m. every Tuesday for the Mind Behind Leadership here live on talkradio.nyc. 
Hey everybody, it's Tommy D, the nonprofit sector connector coming at you from my attic. Each week here on talkradio.nyc, I host a program, Philanthropy in Focus. Nonprofits impact us each and every day, and it's my focus to help them amplify their message and tell their story. Listen each week at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time until 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time right here on talkradio.nyc. Calling all pet lovers. Pet Avengers, assemble! On the Professionals and Animal Lovers show, we believe the bond between animal lovers is incredibly strong. It mirrors that bond between pets and their owners. Through this program, we come together to learn, educate, and advocate. Join us live every Wednesday at 2 p.m. at talkradio.nyc. You're listening to Talk Radio NYC at www.talkradio.nyc. Now broadcasting 24 hours a day. Nonprofits need connections to move in good directions. So come to all the static. Join Tommy in his attic. You're getting a kick out. You laugh. You love the lyrics, or you're laughing about a text message. <laughs> you're on mute. Come off mute, Marisa. <laughs> I'm loving the lyrics. <laughs> Early in the series, I used to make people. I said, "Look, when we come back, I'm going to make you sing the song." Yeah. And like, I stopped doing it because, like, I'm always trying to make people feel not anxious on this show. And then yeah. if I tell them, and they're gonna, now I gotta sing and begin. I didn't want to do that to people, so I it's used perfect, to- it's perfect. It- Shout out to my buddy, Brendan Levy. I call him Uncle Brendan. He's got a band called, uh, they used to be called The Goods. If you've listened before to the show, you know the story. Now they're older men, so they call themselves Damaged Goods. Oh. oh. <laughs> You'd like that. I had my friend on, Sister Tisa Fitzgerald, who runs Our Children, H-O-U-R, which is an organization that works uh, with women incarcerated and their children and making sure they stay connected while the moms are incarcerated. And uh, they also do um, transitional housing and vocational. Everything I tell, as I tell a story, I have to do like a little commercial for the organization. But uh, Sister T was on the show, Sister Tisa, and and I and she's so sweet and I love her. And she said, um, she goes, Tommy, they're not damaged goods, they're treasured goods. And I said, right on, Sister T. But I think that the damaged goods is kind of cute and funny too. And I didn't give them that name. They came up with themselves. That's not me picking on them. That's, <laughs> that's, their, that's their deal. All right. So we've covered a lot of serious stuff today. And we have had some laughs. And, and, I, and I like to do both on the show. And I think it's important that we can do both because um, people come back because they want to learn about stuff. And maybe they want to listen to me be silly. So I have to give the, I have to give the fans what they want. I have to give them a bit of the silly. And the, and the song certainly is part of that. So what, what is this, where's this organization go? I mean, how, what do you need? And, and it's, it seems like the, what you're offering at least fresh tech, fresh check day is, is pretty scalable. Like it's, it's, all, it's all happening. So is it, more relationships that you need with universities and colleges is is it i I know there's it's going to be a money thing we all need more money in this in the sector right um is it strategic alliances with certain businesses that you think would be really complementary to what you're doing or is it tommy d we need a we need a board member who's who can be our treasurer like it could be that specific so you know the next few minutes is about you sharing that type of stuff so i i'm always looking for connections so Obviously, our mission is the most important thing. If you're out, if you're listening and you're affiliated with a college and you're interested in Fresh Check Day, give us a call. Like, or if you work, you work on a college campus, or you're sending a kid off to college, talk to them about our program. Um, we may already be in there, or we'd love to have new introductions. Um, in terms of, um, obviously, we're a nonprofit. We always need donations, but we're always looking for a national sponsor for Fresh Check Day. Somebody wants to have their maybe their um, name on the back of a T-shirt that's all over the country, right? Somebody's working in this college space. Yeah, where again? You don't have to mention them by name, but like by industry, like who has that sort of? Or maybe you have eyes on a specific, and if you don't want to share specific names, yeah. but like, there's a lot of people who want the attention of college students. Yeah, yeah, it's our future workforce, right? Yeah. Um, in terms of our for what's next program, we. Um, are looking for, again, connections to be able to amplify that program. We were 
we have been written into several state and federal grants here in Connecticut because everybody knows our organization. We are one of the leading organizations with only six of us in the office. So we're doing all this stuff with but you're not a lot well, of people. <laughs> well known in Connecticut. Yeah, well, welcome to nonprofit, Marisa. Yeah. Who, yeah. Who, who didn't know you, you wear 15 hats? Like, again, yeah. that's how I open the show. It's not, it's not appropriate, but it is our reality in this sector that we know we got a lot of stuff going on. So, so we're trying to get, um, you know, we were very fortunate to be even written to in a CDC grant that State of Connecticut received for suicide prevention and some, some other grants. So we're looking for organizations across the country that might want to just introduce us to the people, even other philanthropists or other grant funding organizations, just can we get in front of the people that you serve to tell them about these programs? Because look, we live in a resource rich state. Connecticut has, we have a hospital every 15, we have a lot of systems in place to support the mental health of people. And yet we are experiencing a crisis here. Like right, the rest so what about the where they don't have it, right? In other parts of very rural areas spread out, you know, where, where they're not getting this sort of, they don't even have the resources. So, so if it hits us here in the Northeast, what is it doing in, in, in middle America, right? And so, you know, again, these are affordable, they're peer centered. They are, they work. They're not, uh, they're not the whole answer. They are a piece of the, the puzzle. Like that primary prevention thing, we want to get in front of our kids before the crisis because our system is already overwhelmed with having to respond to the crisis of, of children's mental health right now. And the other thing, you know, we talked about MSW students and it's not, you know, limited to that, but we have a nine out of 10 ambassador program. We have a junior advisory to the organization of college ambassadors to the Jordan Porco Foundation that um, they, you know, during their academic year, we take applications in the summer um, and they really help steer us because look, we started this foundation 10 years ago. Our kids are very different. So we need to stay relevant with the young people, with our new high school kids that are graduating, starting college. We need to be relevant with our messaging and our, and our work. We're not trying to be everything to everybody. We have our programs, but we need we need our fresh perspective because that's what keeps us, it'll keep the, our work meaningful as we forge forward, right? And we move forward and um, interact with our young people. So I want to make a, a, a call out to a friend of mine. She's coming on the show in, in uh, I believe it's January, she'll be on the show. But I think just based on the footprint that they're, um, serving from their volunteer base and who you are working with. I think there's some really interesting overlap that it would make sense to, to explore. And her name is Kylie McGrain and Kylie founded an organization called the Moment of Magic. And I went to their gala up in the New Rochelle area uh, about a month and a half ago. I wore a tuxedo and I must say, I looked incredibly sharp. Shout out to the guys at B2B Spoke right in my neighborhood here on Long Island because I found out it was a black tie event like an hour before I was leaving. And I call up my buddy at this spot over here and I go, yeah, you guys run tuxedos? He goes, yeah, when do you need it? I go, how about 40 minutes? And they legitimately had this thing. I went in there, it was just great. I, I meant to do those, uh, a shout out on social media. I haven't done that for them yet, but they got one on the show here, B2B Spoke. Um, but Kylie's event was a special. They they work with sororities across the country and yeah. and they're right. So right on. But they, they a moment of magic is it all happened when Kylie was going to school in, in Riverdale, Mount St. Vincent in, in Riverdale, New York, and which is a very focused on service, a university very focused on service. And um, she came up with this idea for a moment of magic because her mom said, they were sitting on the couch and she was looking for a new philanthropic interest, philanthropic interest. And her mom said, you sort of look like Elsa. So she goes, oh yeah. And that was it. So they go to uh, hospitals with young people who are, who are very sick and some terminally ill as princesses and superheroes that the young men do. And it's so special. Yeah. And I, I mean, I, I saw her actually at the New York city imagine awards about two weeks ago. And it was very, very special. What a, what a, what a, what a sweet kid. What a great organization. I call her a kid because she's a kid and I'm, I'm not. I'm an old man. So, But I think just their, their situation on having this sorority support, and I didn't know this about sororities, but they're very involved in service. So I'm thinking just with their reach across the country, we'll make it happen. Again, this is not the networking show, but I can barely help myself when it comes to stuff like this. So we will talk to that and we'll make a call the three of us will jump on a zoom call like this except we won't record it and let the whole world see that that particular zoom meeting so Tommy, uh, you're a social worker at heart 
I think I probably am, man. Yeah, I think I'm social. That's for sure. I don't know about being a social worker. Marisa, we got to bring this show to a close. My friend Steve Fry has a show coming up right here after us. And it's uh, it's called, um, what is it called? Always Friday. It's called, he's the SMB guy. So I got to make room for him. Thank you for being my friend. That sounds like that song from the Golden Girls. Thank you for being my friend. <laughs> All right, no more singing. I got to do other things. Marisa, thanks for Thank being you. here. Thank you. Thank you so much. One last time, the Jordan Porco Foundation. Dot org. All spelled yeah. out. Jordan Porco, P-O-R-C-O, foundation.org. If you can't find it and you need me, call me. Well, don't call me. I'm not going to give everybody my number. But you can email me, Tommy D at Philanthropy and Focus. And Focus is P-H-O-C-U-S. Tommy D at Philanthropy and Focus.com. Check me out on Instagram. Check me out on TikTok, believe it or not. Let's talk about social media. Tommy D dot NYC. Next week on the program, we have a group from Neve Hanna. Uh, it's an organization out of Israel and they'll be on the show with us. It's be the most packed the attic has ever been. I probably have to move some of this stuff around for all these people. There'll be like three. We're not really going to be in the attic guys, but we have like three people coming on the show with me next week from Nevi Hanna. And um, that's exciting. Stay tuned for Steve Fry, Jeremiah Fox. After that, this is talk radio.nyc and I'm your friend, the nonprofit sector connector. Make it a great weekend. I'll see you later. Thank you. Thank you. Nonprofits need connections to move in good directions. Come through all the static. Join Tommy.